you end up working with the Crays? It's a saying, you're either a boxer, a footballer or a criminal. What was their reputation at that time? The violence. How angry were you after that towards the Crays? Very angry, because I'd been a bloody fool. I'd been told to get the body and chuck him over the bridge on the railway line and let a train mash him up. We started to tidy up and there was a knock on the door. I look outside and there's police out the front. If there's a comedy of errors, there's a tragedy of errors. And what happened that night was a tragedy of errors. Go out the back, there's police out there with dogs and everything. How did you feel when you were in the dock looking at the Cray Twins? Chris, welcome to the show, mate. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, very much looking forward to this one. Let's roll all the way back. Where did you grow up and how did you end up working with the Crays? Well, it, initially, I mean, I was born in Camden Town uh, and then we moved to a place called, uh, just underneath the post office tower, Howland Street. And I came home one day from school. I went to a school called St. Patrick's in Sire Square and um, a Catholic school and when I got home there was kind of fire engine and that outside the house and I said to my mum what, what what's going on and she said the roof caved in because it was all the bombs that were dropping all around central London and they sh they shook buildings and immediately you wouldn't recognize that you know that a place was like wow. dangerous mm. And so there were that many buildings that were. I mean, my playground when I was a child, a youngster, was bomb sites all over the place. So um, they moved us into a workhouse in South London, um, and we were there for about maybe six months. And from the workhouse, we moved to a halfway house in Victoria. Mm. Uh, and from there, we moved into the East End when I was about maybe 11 or 12. Mm. And so I started to recognize there was a lot of racism at the time. And my name gave it away right away. Yeah. When I went to school, I didn't fit in. I had friends, but it weren't the children or the friends that were the problem. The problem were the parents. So, you know, I, I just, one time I went along, got invited to a party when I went along there, the lady whose house it was said, don't bring the Greek kid in. And that, that hurted me, you understand yeah. what I'm saying? Mm. And deep down, it wounded me. So, uh, you know, my dad was the loveliest man, kindest man you could possibly meet. I said to him one day, I said, Dad, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? And he said, I want to be a decent citizen. You know, this oh. Greek man, this immigrant. Yeah. There was no benefits in them days. Mm. He came over here because he was going up the uh, Trudos Mountains with his donkey and his donkey died. And because he had a name, he belonged to a group called Babetus and they were the people who actually took the rifles and the guns over the mountains to the soldiers, the, the British soldiers and the Greek army. And it was all done by donkeys, you understand? Mm. And when it died, so he decided to travel and he went to Egypt and he went all over the place and finally finished up in London as a chef. And he built his own restaurant and a good business it was as well. Mm. Um, but once again, racism stepped in and they smashed his restaurant up. And so it, it, it's just what happens with people, ignorance, you mm. understand mm. what I'm saying? How did that affect you personally growing up with well, this around it, you? There, I'll give you an idea how it affected me. Greeks love to gamble. Mm. And my dad used to like to go to the dog track on, on a Monday evening to uh, Arangay. And there was me with my dad and there was a black guy in front of us. And my dad's, the, the guy said, is this a window where you get your winnings? And my dad said, yeah, it is, brother. I never heard anybody call a black person brother. Yeah. My dad was the first one I ever ever heard say that. 
The other thing as well, back in them days, there were boarding boarding houses or bed and breakfast. No dogs and no Irish. That was plain to see. There was all that ignorance. But I didn't see it as ignorance. Yeah. It words were hurting me, you understand? I wanted to belong. Yeah. And I, I didn't feel I belonged. And so I mixed with all the naughty kids and got myself involved in all sorts of stuff, which I finished up going to an approved school. Um, and I, I just, they thought I was out of my parents' control. I wasn't, but I was in some ways, mm. you understand? Well, you were a big man. Like I was, no, I was a little boy. Yeah, but I'm saying, but now you're a big, you're a big man. Did did, did you get to an age where you're like, right, I, I can handle myself. I'm, I'm fighting here, and no, that was in the, that, that happened uh, in the workhouse. Yeah, okay. Some kids started bullying one of my brothers. I couldn't just stand there and yeah. take it, so I got stuck in, and uh, I learned how to fight. Yeah, and then another time, I was pushing my brother. My mum asked me to take Tony, my brother, out. He was only a baby, in a, in a wheelchair. And these kids tried to take the pushchair off of me. And I remember getting stuck in. They, I couldn't go back to my mum and say, Mum, some children have took Tony from me. Yeah. I, I, I'd, I'd have died rather yeah. than done that. Yeah. And so, yeah, that was, that was when I learned to fight. Mm. And then I learned the power of violence. Don't stand there messing about. I knew how to lose it in two minutes. Yeah. And, you know, I'm talking about lose it. Yeah. It come out and, you know, you can make them run. Mm. So, you know, I learned that. So in the approved school, I'll go into the approved school and um, when I go in, there's this snotty nose kids uh, there, there, and they go, yeah, you. I said, who, me? And they went, yeah, you. Who do you support? I, I, I went, support what? They said, football. I said, I don't support anybody. Well, everybody supports Arsenal. I said, are there any other teams? They said, yeah, the Lily Whites. My mum's name was Lily. Yeah. I said, yeah, I support them. So I really pissed them off, believe me. <laughs> so from then onwards, I've supported Spurs right the way through my life. Okay. And all my family do, mm. you understand what I'm saying? Mm. So there's an old saying, you know, a little acorn, you know, do not ignore the small mm. because it can become big. Mm. So it's been part of my life. When I've been in prison, yeah. I've had something to look forward to a Saturday. Come on, Saturday, Spurs. Yeah. <laughs> and if they're playing Arsenal, come on, boys, yeah. you can do it. So, you know, I mean, it's it's great things. I mean, mm. I went to Liverpool at one time. I stood there when Liverpool were playing a Tranmere Rovers in the FA Cup. I'm, I'm there in a the cot and I'm supporting Tranmere Rovers. They said, shut up. <laughs> I said, shut up. They need somebody to support them. <laughs> all you mob are all supporting yeah. Liverpool. So I mean, I, I I understand that. I understand the underdog. Yeah, I've been an underdog. Yeah, you understand. So anyway, one thing led to another. The approved school come out of the approved school detention centre, detention centre, young prisoner. Then three years for safe blowing, and I came out of there and I was doing great. Yeah, because. Prisons and detention centres are the universities of crime. Yeah. You watch what the clever ones are doing, and it was Bruce Reynolds, the train runner, who said to me in uh, Durham Ewing, he said, Chris, he said, watch what the clever ones are doing and do likewise. What sound advice. Yeah. And his passion was bikes, riding mm. bikes, racing bikes and mm. things like that. Lovely, lovely guy. He was right. But they didn't follow it. When they came out of prison, many of these people, they were tempted by the big money and drugs. Mm. And many of them fell down mm. and got up again. But they got up and they didn't have nothing. Mm. You know, and they struggled and everything else like that. So that was me. I didn't want to touch drugs. When I came out of that three years, or came out of the three years, mm. I didn't want to get in anything. There was speed or there was... A, you know, cannabis, that mm. kind of thing when I came out of prison or from that three years. Mm. But I was directed. I wanted to earn enough money to go straight. Mm. And I was doing that. I met some of the best long-firm men. I met some of the best characters. Didn't use violence. Didn't do anything else. Knew how to earn money. Mm. 
And I thought I was on the right track. I was. But I used to go and see my dad every two weeks because I'd lost my mum. My mum went away on holiday and died quite young. What, is, what did your mum die of? Died of uh, lung cancer. While on holiday? Yeah, while on holiday. Oh. She never knew. She knew there was something wrong, but, you know, she got invited by her family who had not seen in many years to go up to a uh, concert in County Durham and um, got a telephone call. Mum's not well. We all jumped in cars and went up there. When we got there, she'd passed away. How old were you at this time? I was 20 at the time. 20, okay. And it devastated me. <clears throat> I thought, how can anybody they talk about a God? But you, a, a loving father, a loving God would not take away yeah. the captain of the ship. My mum was a lion tamer. Mm. Five boys, can you imagine mm. it? And when we had a row, we had a row with each other. <laughs> and I tell you, it could get quite violent, but she would not fear us. Yeah. She'd come straight into it. You don't do that in my house. Yeah. Now stop this immediately. Mm. And we kind of, and she'd, she'd yank us off of each other. Yeah. And you'd listen to her, because this was a woman who, who gave her life to us. Yeah. You know, so. What was her name? Lily. Lily. Elizabeth. Lovely. Yeah, Elizabeth Lovely. Gartland, her name was. Lovely. Absolutely And insane. where are you in the pecking order out of five brothers? I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the first. You're the first, are you? Yeah, I'm the elder brother. And yet I've lost three brothers now. Okay. And so anyway, I, I, I came out and so I used to come down and see my father. What did you go into prison for your first time? Uh, it was always, I've got, the first time at prison school was nicking lead off roofs. Mm. The second time, um, I was break and entering. Mm. The third time, I got done for uh, breaking into safes. But, well, di dynamite and... and <laughs> <laughs> we used to out the quarries. <laughs> Quality. Yeah. So, so what was it called? I so got caught in a post office in Stoke Newton. Okay. But I didn't do it, Governor. Governor? <laughs> no. Honest, sir. Yeah. <laughs> what did you go in own. there with? On my own, you, I you did by it. yourself carrying. Yeah, yeah. What did you have? No, 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 no. I got into the post office in the night. I got the jelly, jelly night. Yeah. I put it in the safe, the key or the safe. I've got a detonator and I put that in there. <laughs> I lit the detonator and went into a phone box, which was in the post office, waiting to it blow. It didn't. The, the, the detonators were damp. So when I get in there, it's gone down a bit. So I've lit it again. I've gone back in. And waited for it to blow. I've got all sacks of mail all around it, so that it definitely the, the you know the dynamite, the the, the jelly night going off. Yeah. And the next thing you know, is it don't happen. I go out again, lit it again, and then the bang comes on the window. Because in the old days, the post office used to be half. Yeah. The window used to be darkened. Cars, yeah. Anyway, I look outside, and there's police out the front. So I go to get out the back, and when I go out the back. There's police out there with dogs and everything. So I went in the post office. I thought, what do I do? I've got one option here. I'm going to go through that front window. You know the big front yeah, window? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to go out of that window and I'm going to take them by surprise. I went to the back of the post office. I ran at the window, went like that, went through it, landed on the pavement, rolled over, got to my feet, run up and caught a bus. There was a bus at a bus stop nearby. I got on the bus, but there was a PC called PC Trill. Now, back in the day, Trill made budgies bounce with health. Yeah. Everybody had a budgie. You know, the, yeah. the food they fed it was Trill budgie yeah. food. His name was Trill. <laughs> I, I found out later. <laughs> anyway, he, he jumped on the bus. I've knocked him and jumped off the bus, and I'm running. He was super fit. He brought me down, and the others come crashing onto me, and the next thing I'm nicked. And they said, what were you doing in the post office? I said, well, some people asked me to come in and look out for them, and... That kind of thing. I didn't know. I thought it was a sweet shop, to be honest. And uh, and I went in the post office to look for them, but they're gone. So do you know their names? I said, no. I just met them in a, in a, in a pub, and they said, would I help them out? So I did. So it was me going up there. Yeah. But they didn't charge me with a, with a uh, what's the name, with a gel and right and the detonators yeah. and all that. They, they just, as an ignorant kid, Mm. You understand, mm. somebody who didn't know what he was doing. I was used by these criminals that had vanished <laughs> off the face of the earth, but it was me on my own. Yeah. You know, I'd normally work with a team, but they didn't turn up. 
Maybe one of them got in touch with the police. I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, I got three years. Three years. And where, where what was that feeling I, like when you first got sentenced, knowing you're going to get put down for three years? To be honest with you, I I was lucky. Yeah. I've got a detonator. I've got gel and I could have got a lot more. And I could have finished up in Dartmoor, but instead I finished up in uh, Portland, Portland Prison. Oh, what? Yeah, where they've got the bars now. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, yeah, and I did it. I did the two years because you always did a two-thirds. Was it two-thirds back then, was yeah, it? Yeah, back okay. then. Yeah, you did two-thirds and you had a third off. Yeah. Uh, and I came out and I had a girlfriend who waited for me and I got married. Um, but I was leading a wild life. Yeah. I was all over the country doing this, doing that and what have you. And What were you doing? Uh, when you come out of Nick that time, what were you doing for a pound note after that? When I came out of that, I went to work, funny enough, and uh, I was doing okay. Mm. But then it it folded. I got made redundant, and I thought, no, I'm not earning enough to get the things I want. Yeah. And so I got, I got into long-firm fraud, which means you start a company, and uh, you pay all the bills, and, and then, you, then you go in and you order a large amount of stuff. Yeah. And because you always paid your bills, you get a line of credit. Yeah. And sold a line of credit and then... Off you go. Off you go. You understand <laughs> what I'm saying? <laughs> but you you don't do it from your house. You've yeah. got a nice office. You've got everything else. I mean, you've got a secretary working for you and everything else like that. So come on, you understand yeah, what I'm saying? absolutely. What sort of year are we talking here when you uh, came we're out? We're talking about... I came out in the... About 62. 62. And... Uh, then it went from there. Okay. So everything went well, but as I said, I used to, my mum died and I used to come down regular. And I, I, I went down to meet somebody at the Blind Beggar pub, a guy called Connie. And when I got down, he weren't there. So I waited a while and then I thought, no, nah, he's not going to turn up. And my car was in getting service, so I went round to a bus stop round the corner and while I'm waiting there, a guy called Ronnie, Ronnie Bender, he came by and he went, what are you doing here, Chris? I said, I meant to meet somebody at the beggar. They've not turned up. He said, where are you going now? I said, well, I'm waiting a bus to go home. He said, well, come on, I'll give you a lift. And he gave me a lift home and told me what he was doing and all the rest of it. He was with the twins, one of their drivers. I said, yeah, well, good luck, Ron. I don't want to meet him. Thank you very much. And because um, they didn't have a good reputation. Mm. What I'm was a, what was their reputation at that time? Violence. Okay. And a lot of people didn't like that. They went out to work. They would they would they would they go out on the pavement. Being on the pavement meant you went out waist snatching or doing anything. But you didn't use violence unless it was necessary. You certainly wouldn't use a gun. Were the crazed had that violence in them to use it any time? Well, they did. If they, if Ronnie didn't take his medication, which he had to take, it he was, you know, he was off the, off the, off the sheet. If he, if he didn't take it, you know, it was what calmed him down and mm. and everything else like that, because he was totally paranoid, and he had to take this all the time. But certain situations he wouldn't take it, or he forgot to take it. Then you were dealing with a very violent man. Yeah. And as I say, paranoia, paranoia. Mm. But Reggie was a different kettle of fish. He was a thinker. He was polite. He was reasonable. But then he lost his wife, Frances. Mm. And that tore him up inside. And I remember I came out of a pub that Alan called the Carpenter's Arms. And he went. He was walking away. And I went, Reggie, I said, where, where are you going? He said, I'm going to walk, Chris. I said, do you want to lift? He went, no. He said, I just want to. Want to be on my own. He was dealing with grief. Yeah. He was dealing with a situation. She was caught between the two of them, but he was caught between two people as well. Yeah. You understand? He was yeah. caught. One part of him wanted to be with his wife, but the other part, he couldn't leave his brother. Because mm. Reggie, and more or less, would be always by his side. Mm. And I remember Ronnie Cray saying to me one day, in in the widow's pub, and he turned around. And he said, um, "If anybody ever Reggie, he said I would tie gel and right round myself, 
I'd have the detonators and I'd walk right in amongst them. I'd blow everybody up, myself included. That oh, was man. the way he thought, you know. And so I came down to see my father. Uh, no, Ronnie Bender. So I, I was home about an hour with my dad and a knock on the door, it was Ronnie Bender. And he said, Chris, he said, um, the twins want to meet you. I said, Ronnie, I don't want to meet them. Nobody in my life wanted to meet them. Why was that? Because they always, they wanted money all the time. Okay. You understand what I mean? They, they needed money. They were not great earners of money. Yeah. They had their firm going out and getting 10 a year, 20 quid there or doing whatever. Yeah. But they didn't sit in an office in the Hilton Hotel with all like the mafia would, you understand, yeah. sit there and everybody would have an opinion mm. and a way to do things and everything else, the way it would be done mm. properly. It was a shambles. They'd meet in the local pub, mm. but sometimes they wouldn't be in the local pub, so they'd pay a local person, an old boy, to sit in the pub and he'd be the only one in there. And he'd say, what are you doing here? And you say, well, I'm, I'm coming to meet the crazy. And he'd say, well, go there, they've told me to tell you to go here. Mm. And that was the kind of, the way they worked on things. They didn't get out of the East End much, mm. you understand what I mean? Mm. So, and most of the guys in the East End were, as a saying, you're either a boxer, a footballer, or a criminal. Yeah. And a lot of people, they might be decent at boxers, but they can't make it. Mm. And the same as like footballers, mm. they didn't make it, you know. So it, they turned to crime. Mm. What was he so paranoid about? About people. He didn't trust them. You know, I mean, Albert Donoghue, one of his lieutenants, he shot him in the leg. Uh, another guy, they burnt him with a poker. Or, or they're in a club. He gets paranoid and tears into this group of Maltese guys. He just, you know, he, he couldn't handle it, really. You know, it's it's just the way the way he was, but a kind of man you couldn't have met. Yeah. You know, you understand. If he knew you had a problem, he'd, he'd want to help you. He'd want to do something for you, help in any way. But on the other hand, there was this highly, highly dangerous man. So Ronnie Bender said, "Look, they they want to see." You. I said, "Well, no, Ron, I'm not interested." He said, "Look," he said, "Tony's down there with him." I didn't know Tony was on the firm. Tony, your brother. Tony, my brother. Mm. He was on the firm, mm. and I didn't know about it because I didn't really keep a lot, keep in touch with Tony. He lived his life; I lived mine. Mm. Anyway, I go down there once again. This is Tony. I pushed in the pushchair and fought the kids. Yeah. So I, I'm going down there. I could be walking into anything. I don't know. And when I get down there, they said, "Look, uh, Chris, nice to meet you." Um, We've heard you're a decent man and you're living up in Birmingham. I said, yeah, I am. Well, we're opening the club in Leicester. Do you know many people in the gambling world in in, uh, in in Birmingham? I said, yeah, I do. I know many. I know a lot of the casino owners and what have you. Do you think you can bring any people over to our club? Well, if you understand the gambling clubs, mm. the only winner is the club. Yeah. It all goes down the hole. Mm. There's a hole in the middle of the table. Mm. And out of every percent, every every game that's played, a percentage goes mm. down the hole, mm. and the only one who's going to win in the night is the hole in the table. Mm. Anyway, so I said, "Yeah, I'll bring some people over," and I did, and it worked well. But then, oh, we coming up there. Charlie wants to come up and see you up in Birmingham. Charlie, the older crowd. the older brother. Yeah. I took him around, showed him different places, and he couldn't get his head around it. I mean, a friend of mine owned a place called the Ponderosa. Underground car park, house in the middle of nowhere, multi-millionaire. Chris, he said, I've never, I've never seen. You went in the shower, it was a shower for a football team. Mm. You went in, there's a hairdresser's saloon in there. The lounge was like five times bigger than the room we're standing, yeah. sitting in here. Yeah. So they got an idea about it wasn't London where all the money was. Yeah. And the car industry had just taken off in Birmingham. It was a time to be there. I'm not talking about going into clubs and 
asking them for a few quid to mm. protect them. It wasn't like that. Mm. It was the gambling clubs. Yeah. That's where the money was, the casinos. And so, you know, they, somebody would say, like, I'm having a problem with somebody, a gambler, can't afford to pay it or what. So you can't have a talk with them, you mm. understand? And sort it all out. And mm. that was, no violence was needed. Mm. It was just talk. Mm. And so, yeah, that was that's what happened. And everything was going very, very well. And one night I came down. I didn't want to come down that week, but a friend of mine, Ray Mills, said to me, Chris, come down. I've never met your brother, Tony, and you've never met my brother, Alan. Come down and we will go out for a drink. And I said, no, I'm not going down because I'm, you know, I've got set. I'll come down in, next week. He said, no, let's do it this week. Oh, okay, then I had a few drinks. And I said, yeah, okay. And I went down there. Met up with Tony, went over to Wapping, met the Mills brothers over there. And Tony said, well, let's go to Queen's Arms on the Acne Road. We went there and we had a drink. And then I want to go to the best cellar in uh, Leicester Square. Because, you know, all the girls were there and everything else. It was a nice atmosphere. And Tony said, well, they've never been to the Regency. Let's go to the Regency. Went to the Regency Club. We have a drink there. A general invitation goes down to a party. I don't want to go. I, I don't want to go to the party. I want to go to the West End. Yeah. Well, just let's go for, to the party for half an hour. We go to the party for an, half an hour. Jack the Hat comes up to me and said, is there a party? I said, why? He said, I've been told there's one. I'm going. And so anyway, I said, well, come on, I'll go and get my car. We'll all go around there. So when my car was blocked in by other cars outside the club. And Jack said, get, well, get in my car. So we got in his car and drove to the, the house. Door was open. We went in. Jack went running down. Where's the party? Where's the birds? And all the rest of it. And then an argument starts. And Reggie pulled a gun out. And uh, it didn't work. So it looked like a frightener. Yeah. But I didn't come down there for that. I came down to go to a party, not... What was happening? I mean, in front of a room full of people, I mm -hmm. don't think not. Anyway, I went to walk out, and Ronnie Cray came up and said, what's the matter? And Connie said he, he wants to leave. And Ronnie said, take him home. So Connie White had dropped me off home, and he said, Chris, don't go back there. So anyway, I'll go in and have a cup of coffee, and I think, well, my car's up there, and I'll need that for tomorrow. And my brother Tony's up there, mm. So I'm going to go back and get them out. So I went, I got a taxi, went up there, I got my car, drove around to, the, 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 what's the name, to Blonde Carroll's house. And when I get there, knock on the door, and Ronnie Bender comes to the door and he said, Chris, uh, I says, Tony there? He went, no, Chris. I said, right, Ron, see you later. I went to walk away. He said, don't leave me. I said, what do you mean, don't leave you? He said, they've killed him. I said, no, not in front of all them people. No, no. He went, yeah, he is. I said, well, where is he? I said, downstairs. So I go in with him, and this is a soldier. You know, he, this wasn't an ordinary soldier. Mm. He was a Marine. Yeah. He'd experienced every kind of thing you could imagine. And the man was a brave man. I spent a lot of time with him in prison. I know exactly what kind of man. He was a decent human being. No prison convictions, mm. no nothing. Anyway... I go downstairs with him and there's Jack the Hat laying out on the on the floor. But I thought, no, he can't be dead. He's just sleeping. Mm. He'll wake up in a minute. But then it hits you that he, he, he has been dead. And I said to Ronnie, what's your, you know, what's your instructions? Where are the crazy? He said, they run away. I said, well, what are you doing here? He said, they've told me to tidy up and get things together. I said, so what, are you, what, what have you been told to do? I've been told to get the body, carry it up to the well railway bridge, about 100, 100 yards mm. away, by the way, and chuck him over the, over the bridge on the railway line and let a train mash him up. Across the road is an all-night, uh, what do you call it, bagel shop, yeah. where taxi drivers mm. pulling up all the time to get their bagels and what have you. He's got to carry a body... Out the house, out through the garden, mm. which was open to the public, 
take a right, walk up to the railway bridge. Anybody could be coming over the railway bridge. Now you tell me what same man would do that. Yeah. And I, I just, I, I couldn't leave him. I couldn't leave a decent man in the shit like that, like they'd run away and left him. So anyway, what happened then was we started to tidy the place up. I said, come and run. Went in the, in the kitchen, the large kitchen, and there was a basket with loads of clothes and things on. And I got a pair of socks out, told him to put them on his hands. And me, we, we had to get, smother up our fingerprints mm. and things. We started to tidy up and there was a knock on the door. It was my brother, Tony. He come back. So then I told him what had happened with Ronnie and he came and gave us a hand as well. Eventually, we got the body upstairs. I went and got a, a blanket off the bed, uh, an eider down, but there were two babies asleep no. on, a, on another bed. The twins were looking after these children. Anyway, I, I got the got the eider down. We wrapped the body up. We got it upstairs in the hallway. We had to wait a while for it to calm down because the taxis come in mm -hmm. and they get the bagels and that. We finally got out to the got the, the body in the boot, but you can't get a body didn't fit in a boot, mm. so we had to get him on the back seat. And then there's an argument between Tony, Ronnie, Ben, and myself about who's going to drive. And I said, "Look, t I'll drive my car, and Ronnie, you drive the mm. McVitie car." Mm. Oh, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. And I'll give Tony his due. It took a bit of bravery and he went, I'll do it, Chris. So now we finish up tidying the flat. I've got a bowl with uh, blood in it and water. And I'm walking up the toilet. Who comes back with Blonde Carol? And she sees me with it. And I'm putting it down the toilet, which was up on the next floor. Chris, what's the matter? I said, listen, there's been a bit of an altercation. It's okay. Everything's sorted out now. You know, and, uh, but, you, you know, the place is everything's tidy. And we left. Can you imagine this? How can you kill somebody mm. in a flat that doesn't belong to you? Two babies up, mm. upstairs in the bed. You've got the woman can come back any time. Mm. You can tell her to stay in the bedroom like I did with mm. her boyfriend. But the bottom line was, she's entitled to come downstairs and she finds a body down there. D d does that sound mm. like saying to you? Mm. And then they walk away and leave an ex-soldier to tidy it all up. He doesn't have a criminal mind. He doesn't think about putting a pair of socks on because he hasn't got no gloves. Mm. They don't care. He's got nothing. They're out of it. You mm. understand what I'm saying? He can take the fall. It really, when you analysed it and looked at it, it was pure and utter madness. Mm. If there's a comedy of errors, there's a tragedy of errors. And what happened that night was a tragedy of errors. You understand? Mm. Did they need to kill this man? Mm. You understand? They say he's this, he's done this and everything. Why did they want to kill Jack the Hat McVitie? I don't think they did. I don't think it started out that way. But I think the drink, and Reggie was on speed. Ronnie went and take his medication and had, had been hit quite bad. It just all got out of control. Mm. Did the craze twins egg each other on with no, violence? No, no. No. Okay. It was said at the trial, <clears throat> one of the longest murder trials in criminal history, that Ronnie supposed to have said to Reggie, I've done mine, you do yours. That was never said. It was the police who brought that up, which they said that it was said because it joined, it suits them to say that mm. because they're trying to justify that a murder took place. So he was supposed to have said, Ronnie, I've done mine, you do yours. That was never said. Mm. And I know that from the people who were there. Mm. And I wasn't. I wasn't there when, it, when the actual act happened. So anyway, we then get the get the body in the car and Tony drives it away down Mare Street. I'm following up with Ronnie Bender. A police car pulls in behind Tony. Now, if they stop Tony, I've got to do something. Mm. I can't let my brother 
go down for a murder that he didn't commit or anything else like that. The two perpetrators, they're away. They're mm. happy. You understand? They're not even mm. involved. But we're all up to our eyeball, eyeballs in it trying to sort the mess out mm. that they created. Anyway, we think well, we'll get it over the water because in that it was my idea. Get it across the water. The Richardsons have gone away. It won't fall on their plate. But if we put it over the over the water, it'll be it'll be it happened in South London, yeah. not in East or North London. Yeah. Little did we know we were dropping it on somebody else's doorstep. The car runs out of petrol outside a church. So we're driving around. We finally see Tony. There's all confetti on the floor. Somebody got married in the afternoon. We get Tony. We drop Ronnie Bender off and Tony and I go home. Um, it didn't happen. We're not going to talk about it. It don't happen. I got in touch with different people and said, look, forget it. Whatever happened, happened. It, But it never happened. And everything was going to be okay. And it was okay for a period of time. But then they decide to go for different people. Went for Hart. Went for uh, Albert Donoghue and different members of their firm. And their form, firm all decided to fold. So it finished up in the dock. There was Ronnie Bender, the soldier. Mm. The man who had not one previous conviction. With three children and a wife who was faithful to him through 50, 20 years in prison. There was Tony with two children. There was me with one. There was Charlie Cray, Freddie Foreman, uh, a guy called Barry, Reggie and Ronnie. We're all in the, Connie Whitehead, we're all in the dock together. But it was not like you could imagine. There was the Cray trial, which was the McVitie murder. But they thought we won't get a conviction on that. Because the people we're actually putting in the dock are, are incapable of telling the truth. They're trying to work their way out of it. So what we'll do, we'll bring the Cornell murder. So we've got the two murders together. The Cornell and the McVie murder are being held in the same dock mm. at the same time. I'll tell you what happened. I can go back there in my mind and see it right this moment. We're sitting there and we think we're going to win this case. And then a girl stepped into the dock and started to speak. And it was like hearing an angel speak. She was nothing to do with the McVitie murder. She was involved. In, she was the barmaid at the blind beggar. And the way she spoke was the truth. Threats had been made to her that if she didn't give evidence against the craze, not the Lumbrianos or the Benders or the Whiteheads or anybody else like that against the craze, she would have her children taken off of her. So she gave in and she gave evidence. And every word that came out of that woman's mouth, you could hear was the truth. Mm. She explained exactly what happened in, in The Blind Beggar. How uh, Ronnie came in, walked straight up to George Cornell and shot him dead. I knew George Cornell. I found him a pretty decent bloke. You could talk to him. He, he could be a violent man. He could have a row. Mm. But he was logical. He was a family man. But he had said something to Ronnie, so it said that Ronnie wanted to have him over and to walk into a pub and in front of people shoot a man straight in the head, dead, and then walk away like nothing had happened. You ain't going to get away with it. Yeah. And he did for a long time. So basically that's that's the story of the Cray trial. Forget about the McVitie trial. Mm. When that girl, because we're sitting in the dock together, She's the one convicting us. Yeah. And we, we had nothing to do with that, to, with the Cornell murder. And in the end, we didn't even defend ourselves. All we turned around and said didn't happen. We don't know what you're talking about. 
because that is the code of the of the life we led. Mm. But we never did it for the twins. It was all the people we knew who took the fall for us yeah. at different times. So if we had to take the top fall for them, we take it. Because in our world, we would never have been able to look our friends in the face. Yeah. And I can tell you, I won't give you their names, but from pretty significant firms right across London who I've been involved with, if they went down, they never took me with them. Yeah. And the, 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 you know, the, the worst crime you can commit in the under, underworld is to stand in the dock and point your finger at somebody. Mm. I've never done it. Mm. I have never done it, and neither has any member of my family. We've never put anybody in prison. Now I don't live in that world. Since I came out of prison, I've been out 40 years. 40 years, I worked, I worked in, a, in a quarry, a quarry manager. I learned to drive 360 degree machines. Mm. Uh, you know, every, every kind of machine imaginable. How long did you get convicted for? I got, I was given life with a recommender recommendation that I served 15 years. Wow. For something that you didn't do? For something I didn't do. Put what? your hand on the table. Put your hand on the table. Bring it here. I've done more to you than I did that night. Yeah. You understand me? When you, when you came back to the house, what triggered you to go, I need to get this body out, rather than going, I'm off skis? No, no. No. Ronnie Bender was left with it. Ronnie was there, okay. And I knew the man was a soldier. Yeah. I knew he was a decent person. And I knew he'd have to take the fall. And I knew what he didn't know. I understood the way the criminals think. Yeah. And they tidy up after him. Did the craze tidy up? Mm. No, they didn't. How angry were you after that incident towards the craze? I was very angry. I was very angry because I'd been a bloody fool. I should have stuck to my routine and st come down the following week. But I got talked into being a nice guy. Come on, Chris, you never met my brother. And, and the Mills brothers, who the craze had never, ever met, were in the, what's the name? Were, were, were in the car with us mm. when we went there. So I imagine two guys, totally innocent guys, going along there and, and, and witnessing a murder. Mm. It, it, it just beggars belief. Yeah. You understand? What was your brother Tony involved with the craze with? Don't know what they were doing. Yeah. I didn't ask. Yeah. It was his business. You understand yeah. what I mean? We, we knew many. I worked with Richie Anderson, who knew the craze very well. Uh, I, I knew Arthur Thompson, who from Glasgow. Uh, he came down and fronted them up. Um, and also, I knew other people who were kind of, who knew them. Mm. And their reputation wasn't good, to be honest with you. Mm. It was one of violence. It was if a man went out and they did a robbery or do something else, the twins would want something out of that. So if someone goes and does a robbery, nicks 20 grand, they want a piece of that pie. Yeah, they want a piece of that pie. it's nothing to do with them. Nothing to do with them. They no. would just bully them to get that money. That's right. Wow. Yeah, that's the way it worked. And that's why everybody avoided them. Mm. If they wanted to meet them, no, don't want to meet them. Okay. They'd give a few quid to the, the guy who actually came and asked them, would they come down? But you also knew back in them days, like they, you go to a nightclub and you knew them that had just had, a, you'd read the paper and the robbery had gone off. And they'd be sitting there at the top table in the Latin Quarter, drinking champagne and everything else like that. It was a crazy, crazy upside down world. Yeah. You know, and the money never lasted long. Mm. Went out, bought a Rolex watch, bought a car, yeah. did this, did that, gone. Sold the car, sold the Rolex watch, sold that to get by. Yeah. It's there were no winners. Mm. Crime did not pay. Mm. Were they really famous back in the day? Did they, yeah, want, they were. were they looking for fame? Yeah, they were, yeah, without a doubt. And I, I'm convinced that some of the things they did, 
because at the time they were they got arrested they had a guy called John Pearson writing a book for them called The Profession of Violence so it it, it, it was all part but you can't imagine these people where their mind was mm. they've just murdered somebody yeah. and they say to an innocent man clean it up get, throw the body over a bridge can you imagine a man had been stabbed to death mm. you're going to throw the body over your shoulders mm. you're going to throw it over a railway bridge mm. and then you've got to go home and give your clothes to your wife to wash mm. and there's all that blood on your clothing what rational man mm. what sane man would say that why mm. didn't they say come on let's tidy this place up yeah Let's get organised. We've got people who can come down here. They've got a, va a van and all that kind of stuff. No, nothing like that. They dropped everybody in it. And they didn't care. And they didn't care. People I'd never met, I'd never met Freddie Foreman. That man got 10 years. I never saw him in any part of that situation. Why did he get Freddie Foreman get pulled into this? Because they said that he moved the body. Who said? It became general knowledge. Okay. The people who actually uh, grasped the craze up, their firm, they turned around and said that it was Freddie Foreman. Charlie Cray, another one. He was he was in bed. He was with his family. He most certainly knew nothing about it. Mm. And yet he gets 10 years because the person who gave the evidence in the uh, Cornell murder got everybody. Everybody was guilty after that. Everybody sitting in that dock was the firm. And I've lived with that forever. Wherever I went in prison, got one of the cries coming, got one of the cries coming. I wrote a book. And I would not put the name on it because I didn't want them to get any glory out of it. Yeah. I didn't want their name mentioned. The name I wanted mentioned was the man, Jesus, who came in and saved my life. A man who gave me a different direction. A man that told me the right road. There's two roads, the right and the left. He put me on the right road. Read, learn, inwardly digest. Charlie Richardson another man of education, gave me books. Chris, read that. And I think, well, Charlie, if you can read it, I can read it. And he talked to me about minerals. He talked to me about travelling to Africa at a very deep level, telling me what went on over there. Said, read this book about Shark of the Zulu and all that. And the first military divisions were Zulus, the way they fought battles and mm. all that kind of thing the wonder of South Africa. Mm. And they had mines over there. Very intelligent man. And he gave me a book and I read it. And I learned from it. Mm. And I took it inside. I want to know who grasped everyone up for all of these faces to be in the dock when they weren't involved. Ronnie Hart, their cousin. Albert Donoghue. Uh, you had the Mills brothers who just spoke the truth. Yeah. Albert Donoghue did it quite simply because he, they asked him to take the Mitchell murder. The craze asked him to take the Mitchell murder. Mitchell murder. And he had nothing to do with it. And they had nothing to do with it. They wanted, they wanted Ronnie Hart to take the McVitie murder. They wanted Dixon to take the uh, uh, Cornell murder. They wanted to chuck it all on everybody else. Why would people say, yeah, I'll take this for you? They didn't say, say that. Okay. It, when these people were in prison, mm. they were family men. And what they thought was, you know, these people have asked me to take a murder rap and they want to take the, like, the, the fraud and all the rest of it, the long-firm stuff, and I'm going to be doing life and they're going to be out in three or four years. Are they going to look after my family? Are they going to do this, that, and the other? Mm. No. And they decided Nipper Reed offered them a deal. And they took it. What deal was that? The deal was 
give evidence against them, and you won't do a day. They offered me the deal. I was offered a deal. Tintagel House, we know you had nothing, nothing to do with this murder. Tell us about it. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. Because the people I work with, they never put me away. You understand yeah. what I mean? I can't point my finger at somebody because mm. I'm letting all them people down. Mm. They took bird for me mm. when I could have got it. Mm. They didn't. They just took the time. That was it. And in the dock, when the mur when the murder when when things were going bad and there was no way the twins could get out of it, you think being the captain of their ship, they would have turned around and said, "No, Ronnie Bender didn't have nothing to do with this. Yeah. He just came along to a party. They had nothing to do with this." They just came along to a party. They had children. Ronnie Bender had three. Tony had two. I had one. Did they care about them? No, they didn't. We all went down together. We all went down together. What could the craze done? Gone. He had nothing. He had nothing. He had nothing. We put our hands up. It was we us. Put our hands up. They could have done that. Yeah. Because yeah. there was no way they were going to get out of it. Why do you think they didn't do that? because they wanted to take people down with them. So they still had their firm around them. That is what they wanted. They still had strength. How did you feel that day when you were in the dock looking at the Craze Twins? I, d I didn't look at them. We were side by side. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? But you must have been thinking in your mind, going, hold on, lads. No, no I thought about that yeah. because I thought, well, I thought if it had been me, I'd have held my hands up and yeah. said it was me and got other people. I did that a few times. Yeah. And that's the way it works. But with them, it didn't work that way. You know, I can remember going to see their mum when I when the police brought me down from Birmingham and Nipper Reed said, look, there's my card. Give me a call. You know, if you want to talk to me, there'll be no, you, neither you or your brothers will go down. And I went and told Violet everything I'd seen up at Tintagio House the blackboard with all the photographs on and all the, all the different things that they've got from different people. And uh, I said, P just tell the twins I've seen that and make them aware. She said, this is the mother speaking. Chris, please, she said, come and see him. You come and tell him. I said, Violet, it would be stupid for me to go to Brixton and see him. Please, Chris, all their friends are deserted and please do this. I'd not long lost my mum. And I heard the cry of a mother. And I relented and I actually went along and, you know, Charlie went to me when Charlie Cray saw me, he went, shouldn't be here, shouldn't not be here, like that. Looking at me straight, Chris, no, he shouldn't have been here. And I pointed to Violet. And the twins, oh, yeah, lovely to see you, Chris, you know. So you went to visit them at Brixton Prison? Brixton, yeah, I okay. did, yeah, stupid, but I did it. Why did you go there after... Because I listened to them. To the mum. I wanted, I okay. wanted to let the mum know just how bad the situation was so she could tell them yeah. the things that I'd seen. Because in Nipper Reed's office, in Tintagel House, it wasn't Scotland Yard, yeah. it was Tintagel House on the embankment facing the House of Parliament. And I tell you, when I walked in there, there was a blackboard behind him and on the blackboard were all the photographs of everybody and that was it. And I wanted her to let them know what was occurring? I keep them up to speed. Yeah. I should never have gone. I should have said, Violet, there's no way I can go. But she's pleading with me. Yeah. Chris, their friends have deserted them. And that and that was it. Mm. That was it. So fifteen years. What year did you get sent down on? Uh I I got uh sixty sixty nine. 1969. How long yeah. had this case been going on for till you got done for? Uh, it was going on for about a year. What was going through your mind in that whole year? There was lots of things going on in my mind. My daughter came up to see me. She was only a little baby at the time, about 16, 17 months. Um, it was her I was thinking about most. Yeah. Thinking about my wife, how I let her down and stuff like that. I should have, I should have played a better game with her, 
but I was young, stupid. How old were you at the time? Only only twenty one years of age. Okay. I was like. Well, no, no. When I came out of prison, married, I was twenty-one. Yeah. By this time, I was twenty-eight. Twenty-eight, okay. And uh, I was living a high life, like a lot of guys do. Yeah. The women and everything, the drinking, the you know, bit of puff and all the rest yeah. of it, speed, mm. keeping you awake twenty-four-seven, mm. crazy stuff. Mm. You know. What was your lifestyle like in that period? before you got put away for 15 years with the nightclubs, everything else. You said that people will take a rap for you, they keep stum on some other occasions. Yeah, what well, other, I did, did different bits and yeah. pieces, you understand what I'm saying? What other bits and saying? pieces were you doing? Well, just different bits and pieces. <laughs> <laughs> like, if somebody rung me up, they had a problem, yeah. I might have to go and sort it out. Yeah. And, uh, well, you know, it's come see, come saw. Yeah. So... <laughs> it's you know I'm, I'm I'm not happy with my life. I did yeah. the things I did. In fact, I, I I how can I put it? I've examined every one of them. Mm. I sat in prison, Dodge, mm. and this night Charlie Richards said to me, "Chris, he said, come on." He said, uh, "We'll have a cup of coffee and a chat." We did it every night. He was in the next cell with me, and. Um, I said, no, Charlie, I want to be on my own. I've got something I've got to think about. I just felt a bit down. And I went in the cell and uh, lay down on the bed and I started to think. And uh, I thought about the war in Cambodia, my lie. Do you remember that one? Mm. Where the Americans went in and mm. killed a whole village. Mm. And... Uh, I thought about that. Thought about the war in Vietnam. All the unnecessary deaths and everything else like that. And I thought, if there's a God, why does it happen like that? Mm. Why why do we have to go through wars and all this kind of thing? Can we not sit down at a table and sort this out? Mm. You know, on a world scale, we're talking about Children, we're talking about young people whose lives are in front of them. We're talking mm. about elderly people who are coming to their lives. They're decimation, totally destroyed. Mm. And then I thought about my own life. I was given a garden, a beautiful garden, with flowers and trees and bushes and all that kind of thing. But they weren't trees and bushes and flowers. They were people. Mm. They were my flowers people who loved me and cared for me, people who wanted to protect me, people who wanted me to learn, people who wanted to improve my my lifestyle, give me knowledge and understanding. And um, I decimated it. Mm. I pulled all the flowers up, ripped the trees up, the bushes and everything else. I decimated that garden. I totally destroyed it. God did give me a beautiful life. He gives each and every one of us a beautiful life. We are the ones who destroy it. We destroy it in our relationships because love turns to bitterness and hate. Our children are caught up in war zones. They don't want it. They want to see a loving mum and dad. They want to see... They want to be a family. They want to be united instead of the dad saying, you've got to be on my side. The mum's saying, you're on my side, I'm looking after you. Mm. And the father and the mother, grandparents, are looking on in total despair. This is what happens when greed, Money. violence, yeah. anger, mm. distress all comes into it. Mm. And You looking back now at your younger self when you got put away for 10 years, what yeah. was the feelings inside? Inside, I would have walked across the road from that person. I would have walked across the road and avoided him. He ain't me. Yeah. You understand? I'm my father. I am the old man, the old immigrant who travelled to every prison in this country. I'm the man who all my friends deserted me because they couldn't put in a photograph, they couldn't put in an address, and they were frightened of their family getting intimidated 
by the police and having their children maybe threatened. So they stayed away. Because your surname, all the knock-on effects with all you the being knock-on related effects to the craze. All the way round, yeah. Wow. Uh, and they moved us from prison to prison quite frequently. And we didn't go into normal prisons. We went into prisons where there were just seven of us. There'd be the Richardsons, the Crays, the train robbers and bank robbers. You know, so there was, there was that's the way it was. And so when you actually think about, you know, that day and, and I, I, I looked at the devastation in my life that I caused myself. I walked away from everything good. And I thought, how can I put it right? And three people appeared in my cell. Very smartly dressed. The two on the on the side of each one, the, the man in the middle, I, I I don't know, I can't describe them. But the man in the middle, I I saw, and he looked at me like I'm looking at you now. And I said, "How do I put it right?" He said, "Follow us." That's all he said. Mm. Follow us. Uh, and that was that was the beginning of another road. Before we go on to that road, there, I want to find out a little bit more about the the feud between the Richardsons and the Crays. What was yeah. that like being there, around that? It was never there. It wasn't. The, the the Richardsons were businessmen. Yeah, they lived in South London. They they were people people trusted each other. They had a solid firm around them. Mm. You understand? Mm. Where the craze were totally different. They'd take anybody on board that they felt might be handy to them. It weren't it weren't like people had known for years. Mm. So it's not like what the movie movies are made of it. That no, glamorized. No, it's it? all it's all it's all that kind of fantasy. Okay. Y- you understand? They did have proper relationships. I mean Reggie had a, a his wife, Francis. Mm. What happened to Francis? She overdosed, right? Committed suicide. Yeah. Or she overdosed. Mm. Very unhappy girl. Yeah. Totally destroyed by being caught up between them two brothers. Yeah. She wanted Reggie to go straight. She wanted Reggie to be the man she believed he could be. Ronnie couldn't have that. Ronnie needed his second in command. Mm. He was the colonel. You know, Isn't Reggie it, was the lieutenant. So even back then, you're talking about speed come onto the scene. If you're mixing someone who's paranoid, schizophrenia, mixing with speed and alcohol, that's a concoction, right? It is a concoction, yeah. Mm. You don't get any sleep on speed. No. There were preladin and dexedrin with the two speed tablets of the mm. day. There was no heroin or such. People didn't... Yeah. People didn't associate with people who had drugs. You know, it just was not not done. Mm. Um, couldn't be trusted. They were they could be turned this way or that way, so avoid them. But the bottom line was that dextrin and speed, you'd want to fight lions. Mm. You were on a high, and then there was a come down, and you were a walking bundle of dynamite. Yeah. And you, it didn't matter you'd fight anybody. You know, if you put in a lion, then you'd fight the lion. That's what it could do to you. Mm. So, yeah, that's that's basically... So... And what about what, Freddie Foreman? Yeah. He getting caught up with this. I've heard he's a lovely guy. He's a nice fella, Fred, yeah. Lovely fella. Yeah. But the fact was, he got caught up in it for no reason at all. Mm. He should never have been caught up in that. He had absolutely nothing to do with it, the same as Charlie. Yeah. If I, if you were to say to me, in all honesty, and put a Bible in front of me yeah. and say, Chris, put your word on that, that you see Freddie Foreman do something, I'd, I would have to swear by Almighty God, and I do believe, I never saw that man do nothing. Mm. Charlie Cray was nowhere near that night, nowhere at all. And I can swear by Almighty God that's true. Yet both them men finished up getting ten years. 
What I don't understand is you've got the twins, the Cray twins. Yeah. Why would they bubble up their older brother? Why was he involved? Surely the twins would go... Because apparently somebody got in touch with Charlie who got in touch with the twins or the twins involved him and that kind of thing. I don't know what went on between these people, mm. so I really, I can't say. Mm. All I can say is I never heard nothing, I didn't see nothing where them two men were involved. Mm. How many men in total went down? There was uh, Reggie, Ronnie, Tony, uh, myself, Ronnie Bender, Connie Whitehead, um, and that was it. Mm. That was it. So, oh, Ian Barry. Lovely, lovely guy. Yeah. Ian Barry was the kind of man you'd like as a friend. Yeah. He was a man who, how can I put it, he was another military man, and he was in a tank, and he was rescuing his friends out of the tank, and he got badly burnt. The man was a hero, but he got life in 20. You understand? Now, if the twins had have said, it's not down to these people, nothing to do with them, mm. we did it, you know, this, these men were innocent, they would have been respected. Yeah. They would have never done as long as they did. They'd have probably been out in maybe 10, 15 years or whatever, mm. but it never entered their head. And their mother, they loved their mother. I can show you photographs where their mother's leaving Brixton or prisons with a handkerchief in her hand with old Charlie beside her. Charlie was a decent bloke. Yeah. You could speak to Charlie. He was a nice man. He didn't glorify what they were doing. In fact, I don't think he liked it. Mm. He knew things Violet didn't. Yeah. And he protected her. That That's the reality of it. How long did the craze do in total, do you know? 30 years. 30. But then, they Ronnie died before he did it completely the 30 years. Uh, and Reggie got let out on the 30 years, and he died in hospital. So really, not very successful people, have they? No, okay. To spend like 30 years in prison. Yeah. Half their lifetime. Their mother, totally distressed. Their father, full of pain. Their brother, Charlie, finished up going back into prison for drugs and died in prison. So all three Cray brothers died in prison. Not very successful, I'm afraid. Yeah. You understand? Mm. Did you go to the... Cray's funeral? No, because I worked long-term rehabilitation and on the day of Ronnie's funeral I had to take a person to court in London. That was my job. I was a special needs officer mm. and my job was to take people to court and, you know, stand up in the dock and ask they be given a chance or stand up in the witness box and ask that they be given a chance. They'd done the condition of residence we had the funding available for them for long-term rehabilitation and they'd done well during their four weeks of you know, awareness course. Mm. And so, yes, we, we prepared to take them back. And if you send them to prison, there's more drugs in prison yeah. than there is out on the street. Mm. So, yeah, um, and the judges would listen to me. In fact, it got so bad that I got in touch with the old Bailey and spoke to the probation service there and I said, excuse me, I've got to bring people down to the Old Bailey and the court where I was sentenced to life imprisonment with 15 years and I can't find parking anywhere. It's so expensive. So please, otherwise I'm, I'm going to be late for the case. Mm. Can you not, is there anywhere I can park? Mm. And the probation service gave me a, a, a ticket that I could park underneath the old bailey where the van pulled in to take us away. I used to park there mm. and then go up 
through the steps up into the main hall and into the court mm. and speak up for people. Mm. And the most wonderful job in the world. Mm. You know, I, so many things I, I, I learnt there, honestly. <laughs> Smile on my face. Yeah. These kids and men and women give their life to drugs and drink and gambling and sex and all mm. the rest of it. And you, you see them change their life. Mm. But you also see the heartbreak. Yeah. But they've got to be broken down. You can't put a bandage on these people or, or slap a plaster on it. They need to get down to the onion. Mm. Keep peeling it away, peeling it away until you get to the truth. Because these people know how to twist you this way and that way. But if you lived a hard life, you're going to know every move in the book. Mm. And so unfortunately, they can't pull the wool over your mm. eyes. And you get to a place where you get to a place of honesty and decency. And a friend of mine, Steve Walk, he was the director there. We did a po podcast together through uh, a guy called Matt Legg. Mm. Great guy, and, Matt Legg. Yeah, lovely guy. Great bloke. And uh, I'll tell you something. It knocked the legs off him when he heard it. He said, Chris, I've never heard nothing like that. You two guys speaking. Mm. And if at some stage you want me and Steve to do it and you can get anywhere near us, yeah. we'll come and do one. We'll do that 100%. And this is a guy who came from prison, mm. violence, everything else, and he saved so many lives. Yeah. And Dodger, I'll tell you this, he has saved lives. Yeah. And everywhere people know it and they respect him for it. And I'm privileged to have worked alongside him. It's lovely. And I can remember my one flew over the cuckoo's nest moment. I've got to tell you about this one. Uh, I was, it was my weekend to work on because it was a residential rehabilitation centre and in a place called Yarnton in Oxfordshire. Yeah. And uh, I went in and I said to my co-worker, Phil, I went, we're going to do something this weekend. He said, what you got in mind, Chris? I said, leave it to me. I said, I know what I want to do. And he said, what? I said, I'm going to take them away. I'm going to do one foot flew over the cuckoo's nest. I'm going to do what I want to do. So we got a bus. Anyway, I get the residents or 20 of the residents on the bus and I drive down to pool and I go to Litchit Minster <laughs> where there's a Lord and Lady Lees on the property there yeah. called Post Green. It was when I had a... a, 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 a I had a, what's the name, uh, cut me right open yeah. uh, because my main artery was bursting mm. and uh, possible I was going to die. When was this? What year was this? Yeah, this was going back to 1987. Wow. And so an aneurysm, that's what yeah. I had. Yeah. And the doctor to a surgeon turned around, he said the possibility of us saving you are, are pretty low. But I was prepared for it anyway. Mm. I know where I'm going. Yeah. I'm going home. Yeah. And so I went in and um, came out and the Lee community kept my job open for me and everything else. And I had so many visitors. <laughs> all, all these guys and girls and all that who, who were on heroin and crack cocaine yeah. and all that kind of thing. They care about me. You yeah. understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'd be sitting in there. Could be thirty people in the in the visiting room, and they said, "Who are you?" And all these people come along because they cared about me. You yeah. understand? And that was a caring community. Mm. Anyway, I've got them in a the van, and we drive down to uh, Faith and Tom Lee's place, and um, we she makes us a cup of coffee, then some biscuits and things, and then we go down to Paul uh, Harbour. And we watch her, what's her name, the helicopter come in and air sea rescue. Then we went up to uh, Branks and Chines. Yeah, Branks and Chines. Just on the road from here. Yeah, and yeah. we had a, what's her name there, we had a meeting yeah. on, 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 on the sand. Lovely. You know, the morning meeting or whatever it was. Yeah. And then from there we went up to Hamworthy. Uh, and then we went down to, put back to Pool Harbour again, mm. parked up and we're walking along and there's a guy on a boat there. And I went, here, mate, I said, how much to go on your boat? 
You said, how many of you are there? I said, about 20, 21. He said, right, he said, 50 quid. <laughs> 50 quid Every right days. away, all day. <laughs> went round old Harry, Br yeah. went all the way round Sandbanks and yeah. then Brancy Island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely yeah. Beautiful, awesome. Yeah. And the waves coming in their face. Some of these kids had never seen a cow yeah. or, or, or sheep. Yeah. And to go on the sea mm. on a boat, mm -hmm. never in their imagination, they mm. come to the slums of London yeah. and all the worst places. They've been hiding away in the house, smoking the dope yeah, and... Yeah injecting and all the rest yeah. of it now they're free you understand mm. round old harry mm. there's the the cliffs you understand yeah. what i'm saying yeah. it's all it's all so much yeah. more than you know something a, a dream come true mm. like Nick, jack nicholson in one flew over yeah. the cuckoo's nest <laughs> that was my moment yeah anyway i then uh got on fish and chips before we went back, not one of them pulled a stunt. Mm. Not one of them went looking for drugs or drink yeah. or anything else. And we get back on the bus, we get the fish and chips, and we come back to the lead. So the next day, Monday, I go in and uh, Steve Walker says to me, uh, you had a good weekend? I said, yeah, it's a smashing weekend. I said, oh, by the way, I said, I've got some receipts here for you, Steve. <laughs> and I put them on the table and he went, oh, what are they for? I said, uh, Fish and chips, uh, boat ride, uh, this, that, and the other, anyway, mm. all the different things. He said, um, Did the Lee community buy them fish and chips? I said, No, I did. He said, uh, Did the Lee community take them on a boat? I said, No, I did. Did they do that? I said, No, they didn't. I said, I did. He said, Well, you bloody well pay for it. That's how, <laughs> that's how straight he yeah, was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You pay for it. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, it was the best thing I ever did. Quality. I did 50 quid, 60, 70 quid. It was worth a million pounds. Yeah. Powerful, Chris. Honestly. What a lovely human being you are. It's been great talking to you, Boz. You've really let me loose today. Yeah, mate. I knew we'd yeah. get the best out of you. <laughs> <laughs> You're a good man, Chris. Well, the best is yet to come. Yeah, mate. We'll do a part two. Yeah, we will do. Quality. Quality.